going to get into a little bit of history in that tonight. I'm going to push things, uh, boundaries out a little bit, which I know that you'll enjoy. Um, but I've been thinking quite a lot. I've, I've been doing, in the background, I've been doing a lot of sort of study around Book of Revelation, Thessalonians, some of those key um, scriptures around end time events and all these sorts of things. And um, in, a really, in a really positive way, just, just sort of finding new stuff that the Lord's really opening my eyes to and challenging my spirit about, and I'm finding it really good. The, um, thinking today a little bit about this morning, about the, um, that time period in between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew, there's a 400-year period of time where we have no scriptures, no writing, we have no um, real revelation of what God might have been saying to his church or to his people during that period of time. And it's during that period of time that the various... Um, Pharisaical, the Sadducees, the um, uh, the Essens, these different groups emerge um, in and around Jerusalem, in and around Israel, and it seems that uh, each of those groups they had sort of slightly different emphasis. Um, the Pharisees were a strict sect, known for their uh, they really adhered to the Jewish laws and the and to the traditions, the Jewish traditions. The uh, the Sadducees was more the elite, they were sort of um, the high priestly families, the elite uh, around there, and they seem to be more uh, concerned about the political and social concerns. So you've got the Pharisees that really focused on the spiritual things, on the traditions. You've got the Sadducees that um, were more around the social concerns, political concerns and that. And the Essens are really interesting because they were more of a monastic group and uh, we know that um, uh, they were the ones that really protected the integrity of the Word of God. Um, the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you've probably all heard about them, that the, were discovered in the 20th century. Um, uh, they believe that came from that group, the Essence group. <clears throat> and um, when those uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, you've got to remember that those things have been um, hidden or lost, I suppose, for 2,000 years. So that discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls just brought a whole lot of fresh revelation into the body of Christ, really. A lot of new information came out. And uh, I'm, going to read, I'm going to read a little bit. What I want us to realize, I want us to see that in this transition from the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, this 400 years of silence, there's all of these various groups that rise up. And none of them, I don't think, are really carrying um, the heart of God's revelation to the people of Israel. Um, as soon as the Messiah comes, as soon as Jesus Christ comes on the scene, um, these are the people that really mount huge persecution against Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I love the way, you know, the Lord is, wasn't a softy. He challenged them. You know, he said they were broods of vipers. Um, he, he said that they were painted sepulchres full of dead men's bones. Um, uh, you know, when you go through the book of Matthew and you're getting up towards that, Matthew 23, Matthew 24, Matthew 25, all of those uh, uh, chapters, I suppose, that we tend to relate more towards end time events. Um, man, 23, he, there's the woes to the Pharisees and the Lord really, really hammers them. He comes so strongly against them. But uh, what we're going to see from Scripture, we're going we're to see a sort of a, a pattern that actually uh, merges. I'm going to read to you from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. A lot of people say that these are kind of difficult chapters. I know there's a lot of debate goes on around the revelation, the understanding of these chapters, because it, it deals with the, the son of perdition, um, the issue of who's the restrainer and who's the restrainer, um, the mystery of uh, lawlessness. So there's all of these things that um, it seems that people have struggled to lay hold of and get an understanding of some of these things. But I, I believe in, in these days, God is actually opening our eyes to some of these things. So in, starting from... Um, uh, verse 1, chapter 2, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if it's from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So there are obviously people uh, going around at this time and saying, look, um, the day of the Lord has already come. The, the, this, this visitation of God in whatever form. And often what we do is we, the automatic thing here when we think about the day of the Lord and the, we're thinking about the second coming or the final coming of the Lord. But I think there's a lot of scriptural support 
um, uh, to really speak to, to help us to understand that this coming of the Lord was, wasn't the final second coming, but it was a coming of God's judgment on Israel, um, uh, on, on the Jews, on the Pharisees, on the Sadducees, on those who had so vehemently opposed the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? You know what restrains him now. <clears throat> That's a bit of a key verse in there. So that in his time, he will be revealed, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken away, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The, the background story of this, if you want to find out a little bit about the background story of this, is um, about Paul. He's writing to the Thessalonians. He's writing from Corinth. So um, when you go over in the book of Acts chapter 17 and chapter 18, it basically gives you a detailed outline of Paul's missionary journeys, of his preaching, and of what was going on in those days. The, the, thing, the thing that's important about understanding the history of things and the times and the seasons that they're in, it helps you to understand the interpretation of the Word of God. Um, and so what you actually see is that uh, Paul is under, has been under intense persecution, just like Jesus came under intense persecution from the Jews. He was opposed at every front. And uh, now that Jesus Christ has ascended into the heavenly places, the Holy Spirit has been given out. Uh, God has anointed now the apostles to go forth with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that same spirit of opposition and resistance to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, now rolls over onto the apostles. And they start to experience um, intense persecution. And it's really, really interesting. And I'll pull out a few little things. Um, Acts 17, 6. <clears throat> so we read that when they, the Jews, did not find them, that is Paul and the others with them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them and they all teach and will act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king. And so what we see here in the scriptures through here, we see the same pattern. Because what the Jews wanted to do was to, and they eventually did, was to bring Jews, Jesus under the authorities, the Roman authorities, that he might be killed by the Romans. And now you see the same thing going on here with the apostles, is the Jews are the ones that are rising up in opposition and they're trying to bring the Roman authorities to bear down uh, on the apostles, to bring judgment on the apostles. I, I really believe that AD 70 is the exact opposite of that. And when the Romans come in uh, to destroy the temple in AD 70, it's almost like everything that the Jews were hoping were going to take place to those who followed the Messiah actually comes upon them. And we know that the Romans, they actually don't only, they don't just destroy the temple, they destroy Jerusalem. They burn the city. Um, it's really, really an interesting story. Some of the, um, uh, the, the uh, historians in that around that time estimate that there's 1.1 million Jews that were actually killed. But uh, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about judgment tonight, but for you, the church, you shouldn't worry too much about it because we're not coming into judgment. <laughs> Um, and that's the, good, that's the good news for us, is if you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you've believed him by faith, you're not under judgment any law. You know, so even in the final consummation of this world when the Lord returns, he's coming back to tell us our rewards. He's coming back. So for us, it's a celebration. But for all of those who don't know Jesus Christ, it's judgment day. It's, it's the day when they're going to have to face the Lord, face the fact that they've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, and, uh, and face the consequences of, of their decisions and their actions. A lot of people actually say, oh, what's the unforgivable sin? I think the unforgivable sin is the consistent rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ as being the Messiah. It's pretty much the only one I know of that will keep you out of heaven and out of, out of the presence of God and keep the judgment of God on your life. But for us, 
Um, any, any talk about end time, second coming should just really excite us because it's the consummation of things. It's the, the Lord coming back. Um, so um, <clears throat> he says uh, in Acts uh, seventeen thirteen, just a few verses later than what I read, and when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea, they came there likewise agitating and stirring up the crowds of the Jews. Um, and so the Jews are vehemently opposing them. And so what's actually happened is these Sadducees, Pharisees, these Jews are following them around everywhere they go to minister. They're stirring up the crowd in opposition to them and they're bringing persecution against, uh, against the apostles. <clears throat> um, it goes on there in chapter 8 and talks about Aquila and Priscilla, um, how Paul comes into relationship with them. And a lot of those names you'll know, a lot of these stories you'll be um, you know, very familiar with. Um, but what we, actually, what we actually see is, uh, we, I want to show you that the, there's a, a reaction from Jesus Christ towards the Pharisees and the scribe, and a very, very similar reaction comes from Paul himself. So in John 8, 44, <clears throat> it says this, um, this is Jesus speaking to the Jews, to the Pharisees. He said, to the Jews, you are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father, you will do. Now, that's a fairly substantial challenge. <laughs> He's actually saying to them, you are of your father, the devil, and you're going to fulfill his lust. What he wants you to do are the things that you're going to do. There's other scriptures there I read on Sunday to you where Jesus over and over again, he began to share with his disciples that he was going to be taken by the scribes and the Pharisees and the elders, and he was going to be um, uh, uh, crucified. It talks about how he's going to be beaten, uh, he was going to be wounded, he was going to be oppressed, and he was going to be killed ultimately by them. In the, in the, in the book of Matthew, three times he tells, um, he tells his disciples that story over and over again, and every time in different parts of the scripture, he's referring to the Pharisees. See, I, I want you to understand that the greatest enemy of the church is not the world, it's religion. Re religion is the enemy of the church. And, and the, thing about, um, the thing about religion for, uh, and Christianity is religion is the counterfeit. Religion looks like the real deal. It looks exactly like the real deal. And the, and the thing is that the enemy tries to do, he tries to move us off a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ over into religious activity. He tries to bring us under not conviction, which the Holy, the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit ought to actually bring joy to your heart because that's God's redemptive purpose. That's his love. That's his love reaching out and saying, hey, you're going the wrong way. Time to have a turnaround. Get things sorted out. Continue to walk with me. But condemnation is the religious alternative, which is you're no good, you'll never make it, you let the Lord down, God doesn't like you, it's hopeless, you might as well give up, you don't have a chance of getting ahead. So the thing is that a lot of Christians today get confused between the two. And the, and the spirit of condemnation is a religious spirit. Um, Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you put heavy burdens on the people, but you don't lift a finger to lift the burdens off. But in the scripture it says, my, my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus Christ didn't come to put a heavy burden on us or to restrain us or to bow us down or to bend us down under the pressure um, of, of, of the law, but he came to bring freedom and liberty into our lives. Christian people should be the happiest people on the face of the earth and uh, we should be filled with joy and, and, and victory. And we've got to, <clears throat> I think a lot of repentance, you know, needs to go into a lot of areas of our life. Like if you've... If you've um, uh, stopped being open to learning new things in the scripture, you need to repent. Because you know what I found? As soon as people close their minds, they can no longer receive what God may have for them. And I've been a Christian nearly 50 years, but I, I, I pray, I go before the Lord often and say, Lord, give me an open mind. Help me to be teachable, Lord. If there's something I haven't understood, help me to understand it. If there's something I've misunderstood, help me to understand it correctly. If there's areas of the scriptures that I'm not uh, you know, I'm not grasping in the right way. Help me to help me to grasp it, because I know that as soon as pride comes in, we get fixed or set in our philosophy. We stop receiving from the Lord, and <clears throat> and I don't see repentance as a bad thing. I see I see repentance as a good thing. I think we should we should rush in there. So Jesus Jesus said this. So I I've been reading and I I went back in. Um, to um, uh, the book of Revelation, I went back into chapter 2 and chapter 3 
because Revelation was written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And, we, and, and this is why history is so important to us, because we, we need to know who was, the, who was the book written to, why was it written, what were they going through in their day, what's the significance. See, every, every book, like um, say the First Corinthians, for instance, if you've all read that, there were special things, there were things that were going on in that church. There was a guy that actually was having a relationship with his father's wife. I mean, that's a bit scary, um, not beyond the bounds of possibilities in today's church, scary out there. But, and, then, and then also in 1 Corinthians, you get into those uh, passages where um, they say, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos, and they were dividing over which spiritual leader um, they identified with. But see, um, he didn't write to the Ephesians about that. He didn't write to the Romans about that. Um, it, so what you're going to understand is that these letters were written to specific churches with specific needs, specific battles, uh, things that were going on. They were historically in a season and time where things were happening around these churches that needed to be addressed. Now, the principles, the principles are overriding, but you've got to understand what's, what's the principle of God and what is the message that God was historically saying to that local church. I've been thinking a little bit about the kingdom of God. I love the kingdom of God. I love when Jesus came. Well, John the Baptist announced it first. He said John the Baptist uh, uh, started preaching the kingdom of God. And then Jesus came in, you know, and he said, if I cast out demons uh, by, the, by the finger of God, the hand of God, or the kingdom of God has come upon you. And I, I see the kingdom of God as the overall worldwide church of the Lord Jesus Christ encompassing everyone. And then what I see is what they call the ecclesia, which is a Greek word for the gathering of the saints is the local church. I see the ecclesia as the local churches. In the New Testament, those local churches were identified by cities. Now we break them up into all various different denominational groups and all sorts of things, and I think we've messed that all up. But anyway, uh, maybe the, God, the Lord will bring it all back together at some point. So what you see is those letters are addressed to a specific congregation in specific cities. So I'm reading, reading again in Revelation chapter 2, and this, this starts standing out to the church at Smyrna, Revelation 2.9. He says, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich and I know that the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So what do you, what, see, because I want you to see that I believe that AD 70 was a judgment of God that came on the Jews, the Jewish people and the Gentiles. There wasn't just Jews that were killed in that for rejecting the Messiah. And, uh, and oppose, see, all the way through history, when you go right back, you, you'll see the, the, both the blessing and the judgment of God. In Deuteronomy and that, it talks about the blessing and the curses of God. So the blessing of God when he created humanity put us in this perfect, wonderful, incredible garden, and we had this relationship with God. We had one rule, one law, we break it, humanity breaks it, and then what happens is the curse, uh, the consequence, you might call it, uh, kicks in. And so the consequence of that first sin is that we are separated from God, um, we, we, we're going to die, we do, we've, we've died basically spiritually, and also we're going to die now physically. And so that, but when you go through, you go down a little bit further, and you see that uh, the people have become incredibly wicked in the days of Noah, and God, God just had enough. And, um, and so what does he do? He brings his judgment on the people, he floods the earth. Everybody on the face of the earth is basically destroyed, except for the eight people that are in Noah's ark. And uh, the remnant, there's always like this remnant, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, the sin had got so great in Sodom and Gomorrah, God rains fire down and judgment comes on Sodom and Gomorrah. So it comes all the way along. So now we get up into the, into the very beginning of the new covenant, which is not fully implemented until the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit. But we're in this transitional period. And I, I believe that we're in this period where um, uh, there's, there's a, God has got to the point now. See, I wondered why God wasn't talking to them for 400 years. He may not have been, he might have been upset. <laughs> you know, I hear often wives say, oh, my husband won't talk to me. Um, that might be a blessing. But anyway, um, so uh, but what, I, what you actually got to see and understand is, is we've, got to get the, we've got to get the understanding when the judgment of God comes, it doesn't come for us. 
They, it, when, when, um, when the Romans came in and took over Jerusalem in AD 70, um, and there was, they estimate maybe 1.1 million people, Jews and others were actually killed in the city. But the Christians, the, the historians reported that those who believed in the Messiah escaped. They went into the mountains, they went into the hills, they, they escaped the judgment. So all the way through the Bible, the judgment comes on the wicked and the righteous escape the judgment. And that's the principle. So, um, so <clears throat> to the church at Philadelphia means brotherly love, 3.9. Indeed, I'll make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, but are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I loved you. But um, those are the synagogue of Satan. <laughs> These are the religious leaders. The synagogue of Satan. Um, I mean, these are strong terms. Uh, <clears throat> it's um, uh, it, yeah. So we, we go on here um, in First Thessalonians chapter two verse four, fourteen. It says this: For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans who killed both the Lord Jesus Christ and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. So here they were, they were opposing the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles they were coming in direct opposition to that. And, uh, but, but the scripture also identifies that judgment is going to come upon these people because of what they're actually doing. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, Thessalonians chapter 2, which is a, a, a sort of a, a chapter where there's dispute. There's a lot of dispute, but I, I think it might be easier than, than we've actually assumed it says, let no one deceive you by any means, for the day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all things that is called God or that is worship, so that he who sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So it's talking about this one who will come, who will sit in the temple of God, will exalt himself as God, called the son of perdition. And, um, but I ask the question, Paul's writing this, he's writing it to the church in Thessalonica, he's writing it back there, it's about um, 57, 58 um, uh, AD, after the birth, of, it's an, quite an early letter. What temple is he talking about? See, if you, if you want to get out on the futuristic time of, thing you're talking about the third temple that's going to be built in Jerusalem at some time but I think he's talking about the temple that's right in front of their noses the temple is still standing in 57 60 it's not destroyed until 80 70 and so I, th I think I think he says I think he's talking about that temple and um, there's been there's been no temple built since the destruction of that temple in AD 70 See, I, I think some of the end time teaching that we've actually got into and that has saturated our world, it's, it puts everything off. It puts everything in a futuristic context. And, um, you know, I know that you, you, if you go online, you see people now are getting red heifers and without blemish and taking them over to Israel. And, you know, there's stories about the, um, I saw one the other day that really interested me was um, the uh, Papua New Guinea, which has, is a gold rich nation. And the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea was making the statement that he had opened up these new gold mines. One third of the gold went to the government. One third of the gold went to the people um, who who owned the land, who the land, and one third of the gold was going to Israel for the rebuilding of the temple. And then they had photos of these uh, gold little gold ingots with you know Israel written on them, and that they supposedly are sending off over to Israel to build this third temple. I think, I think that um, when I go back and look at this, Paul's not talking about a third temple that hasn't been built nearly 2,000 years later. He's talking about a temple that's just down the road. It, it, there's, there's things that he actually says in here. Um, I think that um, Paul is dealing with issues of that day. He, this is what he says in, two, in chapter 2, verse 5. Do you not remember when I was still with you? I told you these things. 
And then he says this, now you know, you know what is restraining. You know what is restraining. He doesn't say that it's confusing, the, rest, the whole thing about, because there's all these things about, that's one of the questions. Who's the restrainer? Is it the Holy Spirit? Is it God? Is it this? Who's the restrainer? Well, it may be a little bit uncertain to us, but it wasn't uncertain to them because that's what Paul said. You know who the restrainer is. So he's talking to them and their day and their time. You know where the temple is. Herod's temple, it was the greatest temple ever built. It's just down the road. You know who the restrainer is. That's, what, that's actually what the scripture's saying. I mean, to actually, to take these scriptures and always push them into a futuristic position, I, I just think it's, it's almost abusing um, you know, what the scripture's actually saying to us. Um, Paul told them what thing, the things, he said, I told you about these things. What was he, what did he tell them about? What did they already know about? I believe they already knew about the son of perdition. I think they already knew about what was going to happen. I think he was already talking to them, revealing to them the things that were going to soon take place. Um, and he, he also, they obviously were aware of what was actually restraining. <clears throat> it goes on in Thessalonians, and, and um, uh, let me see, he, he's, he, they know who the Lord, or the one who's restraining is. I think they possibly are aware of who the lawless one. When, when you actually get into the history of all of these things, you begin to s- discover a lot of things about the Caesars and what was going on historically around that time. And that's why that's why Bible history is so important because you get the you get a bigger picture, you get a you get a, a much bigger picture, and I think they they knew what was going on. Um, the Romans at this time had not really upped the ante on persecuting the Christians. In fact, what actually happens you'll discover um, as you read through Acts seventeen and Acts eighteen. Um, what you actually discover there comes to a time when the Romans get so upset with the uh, religious leaders persecuting the Christians and causing riots in Rome, they forbid all the Jews living in Rome from living there. They, they send them out. They send them out from Rome. And that's why Aquila and Priscilla, they end up in Corinth because all of the Jews have been banned from Rome. And the reason they were banned was because the religious leaders and that were causing riots all of the time. And upsetting just the thing. So that, that Caesar who was ruling at that time, he just banned them. But when Nero comes along, uh, who, who uh, you know, uh, when you study Nero, you find that he was, incredibly, he was incredibly wicked. He was a bit of a psycho. When Nero comes along, he goes in and actually de- he goes in and he deals to um, Jerusalem and to the temple and to the religious leaders. And, um, and his, his judgment... I believe, see, all the way through history, God used other nations to judge Israel. They, you know, they were, they were taken into uh, slavery by the Egyptians. They were taken into bondage by the Babylonians. They were taken into the bondage by the Persians. They were taken into bondage by the Greeks. Um, uh, all the way through, what God did is Israel went into slavery or bondage to different nations because because of their sin, Nancy and I had a good, robust discussion the, the other morning about um, uh, divorce. Because uh, uh, when, you get in, when you get into it, God starts referring, uh, referring to Israel as his wife. And uh, in the Old Testament, he, he talks about Israel being his wife over and over and again. And you know what the punishment was for adultery. If someone in a marriage relationship committed adultery, God's punishment, well, they, they were to be stoned to death. And, uh, and, and it's really, really interesting because what in the Old Testament, what God does over and over again, he calls them an adulterous people. He, he, calls, he calls them, you know, some pretty serious names. And um, it's interesting because uh, um, uh, the punishment for adultery was stoning to death. And what you actually see is when um, the judgment came on Rome and on the Jews in Rome, they, they, um, the Romans came with these big catapult things and they were shooting um, rocks over into Rome. Uh, a lot of the rocks, they said, they were actually ignited with fire. That's how Rome caught fire. But the, the rocks were white and the size of a talent. And there's other prophetic scriptures that talk about this, about hailstones, white stones or hailstones the size of a talent coming down in judgment on Israel. So we, we see this picture about how, 
how um, Israel is the bride of Christ. When you get over in the book of Revelation, he talks about um, uh, Jerusalem, uh, who, which is the, you know, the, this cherished city of God. Um, when you get over into Revelation, he, he describes uh, Jerusalem as, as Babylon. As he's got all sorts of incredible descriptive names for Jerusalem because of their apostasy, because of their adultery. They turned again and again to idols. They've gone away from the things of God. And so the judgment of God comes, but not on us. Say not on us. <laughs> oh, you're so responsive. <laughs> so... Um, <clears throat> So I, 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 really believe, I really believe that I don't have a problem with, um, at all with God bringing judgment um, uh, on Israel because the state, the state of the people of God in the time when Jesus Christ came to earth, they were, they were in a shocking state. They were in a terrible state and they were, they were a long, long way uh, from God. The scriptures like... Um, like this, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. And even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Now that same verse, listen to this, from the book of Matthew chapter 24. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then in, in, in 34 of 24, it says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So we see in Matthew 24 and Revelation, they, these, are parallel, these are parallel scriptures. I think they're talking about exactly the same thing. So we, we think that when the, when the Lord's coming in the clouds of glory, we think, oh, it's the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we're all going to go to heaven. We're never going to cry. No sickness, no sore legs. It's going to be brilliant. But... What we, when you begin to read those scriptures all the way back through the Old Testament, it doesn't always um, uh, represent the final coming of Jesus Christ, the second coming. It often represents actually God's judgment coming on Israel. When it talks about nobody knows the time, nobody knows the hour, see, we, we all, our mind, we've been, we've been um, uh, educated or put on our minds to always think that that relates to Christ's final coming and we and we don't know the time of the hour but I don't think they knew the time of the hour when any of the judgments were coming I don't think Sodom was prepared for um, uh, the fire and the brimstone to rain down on them because of the sin I don't think the world was well the world obviously wasn't prepared when the flood came to Noah because there was only one guy built a boat so you know when you go through so the judgment of God comes and it's just as mysterious when God's judgment is going to come um, uh, on those who have rejected Jesus Christ as it is the return, the final return of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes to earth and, and, and this life as we know it. You know, why does it, why does it refer to the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride? <laughs> why did God institute marriage in the garden, the covenant of marriage in, in the garden before the fall of humanity? Why did God refer to himself um, through the Old Testament Bible as being the husband of Israel and, and, the, and the wife? Why are we the bride of Christ? <laughs> Why is the, the parable of the, the, the wedding supper? Why are all of these things so important? Because see what actually is happening in the scriptures, God is painting these pictures for us to not so we would not understand, but so we should understand. Even in the book of Revelation, he starts off by saying, this is the, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's, he's writing that book that we would understand not that we would be confused and we'd struggle forever. It's meant to be understandable. It's meant a revelation is bringing something out of the dark into the light. It's meant to be understood. We're meant to understand it. And, um, and I, I think that, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things that the enemy does, he hoodwinks us um, and, and, and puts a lot of things in the, uh, in the, in the too hard box for us. Let me, let me, um, let me read Revelation 1.1. If this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must shortly take place. Revelation 1 verse 3. Blessed is he who reads those things, who hears the word of the prophecy, and he the things written in it, for the time is near. So what, what, do, we, what do we do with all of these things? It's now. It's near. It's soon. He's coming. 
all of these seas. So what we, if we're going to actually postpone all of this activity of God to some, we don't even know when. Like how many times have they predicted the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ or the millennial reign of Jesus Christ? I did a search the other day, hundreds. One guy wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Christ Is Coming in 1988. 88 re- and then because he never showed up. Oh, I've been waiting for 50 years and he has, hasn't shown up now. So there's, there's something like we say, oh, just keep believing. Well, maybe there's something wrong with our theology. Maybe, 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 maybe what's happened is there's actually something not quite right with our theology here. And we haven't fully understood what God is actually trying to show us. Um, I, I, I've, I feel like in, in my spirit, I know like, all the way along from the first time that I became a Christian, way, way back in 1975, 75 in the 70s, the end time preaching was just, that was it. That was, that, was, that was being preached all the time. Jesus was coming back at any moment, any day, any moment. After a few years and a few prophecies and a few dates that have been set, you begin to lose a bit of faith in it. You begin to realise, hey, it hasn't happened. Like I could guarantee to you, and I, like I bet you $100,000 that you'll be here tomorrow and he won't be. Now, this is probably the night that he's going to come back. <laughs> That's what you're all hoping. I'll owe you $100,000. But I'm pretty certain that I'll be up in the morning having me Marmite on toast. And so will you. Well, maybe not Marmite on toast, but not something quite as exclusive as that. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is, what I'm trying to say is that um, and I, I, think, I think that, that certain end-time philosophies, and I call them philosophies because I don't think they're full revelation, have been presented um, to the church and to the world over and over and over again. Even the guy that wrote the, the, the late great planet Earth, Hal Lindsay, he predicted the second coming of the Lord, and it, it never happened. It's, it's got to undermine the... There's something at some point has to undermine the credibility. I read of C.S. Lewis, who was supposed to be a bit of a brain. I never liked his books, but probably I wasn't bright enough for his books. But you have to be really bright for those books. So some of you people are loving it. You're feeling really good about yourselves right now. But anyway, <laughs> he actually said about uh, Matthew 24 that Jesus Christ missed it, that, that the prophecy of Jesus Christ in Matthew 24, that it, it, it was a disaster because he missed, Jesus Christ missed the prophecy. Well, who are you going to believe, C.S. Lewis or Jesus Christ? I don't think Jesus Christ missed it. C.S. Lewis, with all of his wonderful brains and all of his fantasical books, Lions, Witch and Wardrobes and all sorts of wonderful things that some people love that I don't. But anyway, how, who did he think he was? Thinking that he had a greater revelation, that he could challenge the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know sometimes when you're preaching, I say, man, the red letters in the Bible, the red letter Bible, reading the words of Jesus Christ, there's nothing more powerful than his words. They, see, a lot of the reformers, they don't want to read Jesus. They want to read the letters. They want to read the Paul. Why would you read Paul? He's like the moon and Jesus is the sun. Now, I know they're all in the scriptures and all scriptures are valuable and profitable for us. We under, I understand that, I understand that, but there's something about Jesus. There's something about Jesus Christ and the word that Jesus said. And I think if he said soon, he meant soon. I don't think he was always using double talk. I, don't, I, just, don't, I just can't see it. I, I, he hasn't done that to me in my conversations with him. Not that he's told me anything much about the end times at all, but all I know is he says it's straight. He tells you truth. And I don't think, I don't think, um, I, I don't think it's all that mystical, um, Matthew 24, 16, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Well, that's what happened. When the Romans came, the Christians fled to the mountains. And when the Romans came to destroy the temple in Jerusalem, the Christians fled to the mountain. That's what happened. So they went to Judea. It's not talking. You're not in Judea. You're in Christchurch. It's not talking to you. You're not there. You say, oh, well, it's a, it, means, uh, it means what? It means Judea. That's what it means. <laughs> That's what he said. That's what it means. But you see, I, I think there's, a, there's a, a lot of stuff that's gone on in the body of Christ. And just because other people say it, we, we, we want to be believing. We want to accept it. Like 
go, you've got to go back to your scriptures. You, you've got to go back, not only to your scriptures, you need to go back and study the history surrounding all of these events. There's, there's actually historians at the time of Jesus Christ that wrote about the things. They were outside of the church. Some of them were inside. Josephus was one. He was, he was with the Jews and then, and then he was with the Romans. He, he flipped sides as he went on. But he was a historian. He writes about a lot of these. There's other, Irenaeus, there's other uh, historians at the time that wrote about these things. Because I think, I think the, um, uh, you know, there's a challenge for us to dig deeper and deeper into the words, into the words of God and uh, into the understanding of the word of God. So I, I think that um, personally I'm feeling quite strong. And let me find a couple of notes that I had here. <coughs> um, You're doing all right out there? You're still in one place? I still haven't found the right page. I printed off like 24 pages of notes. I should finish about 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> anyway, I think we've got to get some of this stuff into us because um, I think that we need to have, I think, I think really... That, that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today, we need to have a positive attitude about being on the earth in this time, in this season. I believe that we need to be dreaming big dreams. I believe that we need to be making great plans. I believe that we should be um, allowing the Holy Spirit to move on our lives to, to accomplish great things. I, I don't think we should be just you know, tying a knot in the end of the rope and waiting for the Lord to return and everything's going to be all right. I think we need to be exercising the authority that God has given the church um, that it's very clear, you know, all authority on he in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of every nation. Over and over again, the Lord, every time the Lord commissioned, um, even when, when the, the disciples, he sends them out and they come back and they said, they said uh, even demons, even demons are subject to us in your name. And uh, they were excited about it because this was all new to them. These were, these were religious people that had no power that had come into relationship with Jesus Christ, who was a miracle-working saviour, and this is even before the ascension of Christ, and just by being in that physical relationship with him, signs and wonders and miracles just started to manifest out of their lives because of that relationship that they were in with the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, that's, that's the same for us. When we come into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, signs and wonders and miracles begin to happen. I'll give you a little tip if you're a baby Christian. If you've only found the Lord quite recently, pray, ask for everything. Because um, I remember when Nancy first came to the Lord, it was, it was almost bizarre. Like she would pray for, like one day she prayed for a bird and this lady knocked on the door from, we were living in this big boarding house thing and there was all sorts of druggies and everything living in there. This person comes and knocks on the door and has got a bird in a cage and said, oh, I'm going away, I can't take this, do you want the bird? She had prayed for a bird. I remember she prayed for a pot, like we used to pray for pot, but she prayed for pot, <laughs> pots and pans, you know. And um, I came home that night and she, somebody had turned up and given her pots and pans. It's almost like, it, it, like I was not a Christian at that time. It was like, this is weird. You know what I mean? This is, this is really weird. Like this whole thing of prayer and all these answers but, um, you know, it's sort of like, I think as you get a little bit older in the things of the Lord, he wants you to trust him more. <laughs> he wants you to take a little bit more responsibility. So the key is, if you just recently, just go on, go on, I've, go on. A, you could call it almost like a spiritual spending spree. You could just, <laughs> he just puts, pulls out extra grace for you when you're a baby, you know, and does all these, these amazing things. But when you, when you grow up, when you grow up under the things of the Lord, I believe we're, we're, we're meant to carry his mantle. We're meant to carry his blessing. We're meant to carry his presence. We're meant to carry his authority. I believe, I believe that we're meant, we're, we're, we're meant to be saturated in the presence of the Holy Ghost and we need to be recognised that Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is on our lives no matter where we go. I think that, I think that people should manifest when we turn up. They manifest when Jesus turned up. Why wouldn't they manifest when we turn up? But I, I think, see, we, I think we live now supernaturally, spiritually. Ephesians says you're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And uh, I think we're living now in a, in a supernatural 
season um, on the face of the earth. But I, I, I sometimes think that we as the church, and I include myself, we don't fully understand what we have access to. We, we just don't fully understand uh, what is available to us in God. I think, there's, I think there's way more out there available to us in God than we are presently laying hold of. And I don't, I don't think it's the Father's problem. I don't think he's withholding. I, th- I, think, it, I think it's us. <laughs> if, if you're ever going to have a discussion with God or an argument with God or a disagreement with God, the best position to take is it's not you, it's me. It's always me. If we're living below um, uh, New Testament Christianity, it's not his fault. It's, it's, it's something here, you know, there's something that we need to be open to allowing him to just adjust in our lives. And I don't mean that in that we should be condemned. or It's not about being condemned. It's about allowing the Holy Spirit to transform you by the renewing of your mind, by your understanding of the scripture, your understanding of the spirit of God, allowing him. See, as soon as we think that we've got all the answers and we nail it down, we, 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 well, I think we, we commit the, we commit a, the stin, almost a stiff-necked, stubborn sin, and we can stop the revelation of God coming into our lives. We've got to, we've got to remain open to what the Holy Spirit has to us, not to every slippery thing that's coming down the pipe, but to what the Scripture really has to say and what the Holy Spirit has to reveal to us. I, I think we're a mighty army. I think we're, I think, I think we're a mighty army in God. I think we're a beautiful bride. It's a bit hard for me to say as a bloke. It's kind of hard to relate as a beautiful bride, but better than an ugly one, eh? But anyway, we won't go there. (laughs) We're the bride of Christ. Ephesians says we've been washed. We've been washed in the word of God. We've been purified and cleansed in the word of God. The beautiful thing about the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ is that our righteousness doesn't come from our works. It comes from our faith in him, our trust and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that I'm not saying it doesn't matter if you sin, but what I'm saying, John 1 says this, I write to you that you sin not. He doesn't want us to sin. But if you do, this is, this is the blessing. If you do, you have an advocate. Well, just go to the advocate. Don't beat yourself up and say miserable and get depressed for months on end and blim and squirrel away and all of the things that the enemy wants you to do. You take it to the Lord. Lord, I need help. And well, you do it again. I need more help. You do it again. I need greater help. <laughs> sooner or later, sooner or later, there's got to be a miracle there for you. But you realise if you're falling and you're struggling in an area of your life and it's, and it's a habitual area that you're struggling with over and over and over in your life, the first thing you've got to realize is you don't have the answer. And just be honest with God. I don't have the answer. I don't have the ability. So what do you do? You throw yourself on the mercy and the goodness and the grace of God. Nancy and I were having this heated debate because she says, God hates divorce, book of Malachi. She said, I just can't imagine that God would ever divorce us. And, um, and you know, I'm a bit more... see. The trouble with us, our family. I'm going to share family problems now. <laughs> Every time God comes to Nancy, he tells her how much he loves her. Every time God comes to me, I'm behind the woodshed. <laughs> here's the love, here's the judgment, I suppose. I, I, see, but it's, it's, it's both. Jesus said, he said, the Holy Spirit said, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's, it's not that God ever does. It's we go away from him. And if we continue to go away from him, the reality of it is the first sin in the garden, we divorced God. He didn't divorce us. We divorced him. And the, the, the trouble is the penalty for divorce was, was death. <laughs> Nasty. But anyway, um, if we walk away from the things of God, if we allow religion to come into our lives and we begin to try to earn our acceptance with the God and you know, we begin to operate not in faith but out of religion, well, that's actually, if you understand that that's actually idolatrous, we're now, beginning, we're now beginning to, I suppose, embrace another partner. People don't understand, like, um, you know, one of the attacks, I believe, in the church in New Zealand is the whole, that whole, the whole cultural thing that goes on. You can't, 
You can't get into the kingdom with your culture. That's what God's showing the Jews. It's not, it's not the Jewish culture. You can put a, a tea towel over your head. You can blow the shofar, run around with a bottle of anointing oil. You ain't gonna, it doesn't get you in, none of that gets you into the kingdom. It's, it's not about culture. It's about, it's about Christ. It's about a new beginning, a new life, a new person, a new start coming out of the world and into the kingdom of God. It, it, this, is, this is the place where we're all acceptable through Christ. We were all acceptable. We all come in through Jesus Christ. And uh, I, I, just, I just love, I, I, I pray, I want the, you know, I know people get upset about immigration and stuff like that, but I, I pray for the nation. Come, bring, bring them in. They either come in here to find Christ or they come in here to bring Christ to us. That's what I believe is happening with immigration. That's how I see it. Say, so, oh, they're coming to take our jobs. <laughs> Not if you get up early and go out and do some work. But anyway, <laughs> but you think about it. Think about it. They're either being brought here from the nations to find Jesus Christ, because we're about the gospel, or they're bringing, they, they already know Jesus Christ and they're bringing the revelation and the message of Jesus Christ to us. What a blessing. You guys have met John O, you know, the Korean pastor from across town. What a great guy. Though he's got... He, he's got churches in Korea, not because he knows us, but he tells me about churches in Korea that pray constantly for New Zealand. they just praying constantly for New Zealand that we might experience revival and the presence of God. He said the Korean people are so grateful for the, to the West that they brought the gospel of Jesus Christ. They want to send missionaries out into every nation of the world to say thank you for bringing Jesus Christ. He's talking about his family situation where, um, um, you know, like around the time of the Second World War, the Korean War, um, South Korea was in abject poverty. They were starving. They were broken. You know what turned that nation around? Now you all drive Hyundai's. You know what turned that nation around and LG appliances in your house? You know what turned that nation around was the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ went in there. And there was a mighty revival. Even, you know, Paul Yongi Cho or David Yongi Cho, I think he changed his knife. Uh, in the name of a few times. He, should have pro he pr probably should have changed the Yongi Cho part because he kept that, but he changed the front. Anyway, won't go there. But I uh, had a church of a million people. Um, well, at, that time, at that time, it was the largest church in the world. And they are forever grateful for somebody from the West, he says, brought the gospel to them that changed the whole of their nature. They embraced the gospel and God prospered them amazingly. If we embrace the gospel in New Zealand, God would prosper us. You know, um, you guys got an election coming up, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anyway, we won't go there <laughs> as much as I'd love to. Um, but um, let, me, let me just, let me, uh, just under, understand this. The, the last time that um, Israel really experienced freedom from oppression was, was the last time they really, was that was during the time of the reign of David. It was about a thousand years um, uh, before Christ was born. And King David, remember there was peace, he brought together the northern and the southern tribes and there was, and there was peace in the land. Then they go into captivity to the Babylonians, which is a judgment. Then they go into captivity to the Persians, which is a judgment. Then they go under captivity to the Greeks, I mean, you talk, you talk about that, that nation. Um, they've got a wonderful history in God, if they could see it, and a miserable history because they don't follow the Lord. They just keep going into bondage. There was a little period of time, they call them the Hashmonite dynasty. It was, a, it was after the, you might have heard of, if you've done the Israel study about the Maccabees and the, you know, the battle with the Maccabees and the Jews actually um, uh, drove the Greeks out and had a period of time where they actually ruled in, in Jerusalem. And, um, and then, of course, the Romans come in. Well, the Romans took over just about everybody, didn't they? They, they conquered all of most of Europe and England and Scotland, all of that. They were all conquered by the Romans, um, if not at that time, later on. But, okay, what we see with all these, what we've got to understand with all of these things is the judgment of God. God comes and judges those people that turn their hearts against the Messiah, that persecute the church. Um, you'll get to the point now where you realise that we, 
we now, like he talks about, um, we are the sons of Abraham. Talk to, he challenges the Jews in the New Testament, basically saying, you're not the, he actually says to them, you're not the sons of Abraham. You're not the sons of Abraham. You're, you're of your father, the devil. He even talks about, I'm going to go to a new people, a, a new people that will love me. And, and <laughs> I could get into the Israeli thing and that, but... Um, because I think there's a bit of weird stuff going on. I don't think the way to help Israel is giving them money. There's a lot of Israeli ministries that ask for money constantly. How can you bless Israel? Give us money. Well, how can you bless Murray? Give me money. It's pretty natural. It's not money they need, it's Jesus. I, 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 I've got a lot of the... Um, you know, on a lot of the prayer forums and everything for Israel and that, but I just can't get away from one prayer. I'm not praying that they, you know, regain all of their land and all that stuff. They just need Jesus. If they lay a hold of Jesus, Jesus can work all the rest of the stuff out. If they don't lay a hold of him, it's hopeless. I don't, I don't, think, the, I don't think you can, and this might upset a few people, and I love upsetting people really, it's just part of my gifting, but I don't know if they can justify... I know they want to destroy Hamas. I don't know if they can spiritually justify it. I think they can justify it from the Old Testament and Judaism, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, wipe them off the face of the earth. I don't think that's a Christian response. You know, I said I've got a very good friend who's right into all of that stuff, and when I kind of said that to him, he got mad. I thought he wanted to kill me. I thought, you've got to, wait. You've got to see it from God. You've got, to see, you've got to see it from the spiritual perspective not from our anger or our offense or they've done this to us and i need to do we need to do that to them at some point if if israel once again loses the pleasure of god they are lost done and that's that's the message for all of us i think there's one prayer to pray for them i don't think send them, i don't think send the money i don't think that's the answer at all that's mammon yeah, I, I think that a lot of those ministries are asking them money. They're asking for the wrong thing. They should be asking for prayer. They should be asking, asking, asking for the Messiah, asking for the revelation. That's what they need is the revelation of the Messiah. And um, again, I know that these are touchy issues and some people, they'll disagree. Well, you're more than free to disagree. But I still, for me, I'm only still going to pray one prayer. Save them, Lord. Let them see the Messiah. Let them see the answer to their lives, their nation, the whole world. Let them see the answer. Let them come into the kingdom. Let them, I mean, forget about all of the, the stuff, even, even in this world. What use is all the stuff in this world, even if you gain all of the stuff in this world and lose your soul? What, is it, what value does it have to us if we don't embrace the Lord Jesus Christ under salvation? That was the whole message. That was the message. That was the Messiah. Man, I'd give my eye tooth to have been alive in the time of Jesus and to be sitting under his ministry, his preaching. Must have been incredible seeing him operate and move, seeing all the miracles taking place. And, and, and see, it was, it's almost like that's a forerunner. We've got to recognize now, and I'm going to, the musicians can come, we've got to recognize now we have the Holy Ghost. We have the Holy, we have the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I've got to go because I've got someone to send to you. We have the Holy Spirit. And um, I, 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 just, I just think, man, we just have to lay hold of him. Lay hold of the Holy Ghost and let him really leave, leave, lead our lives and revolutionize our life. Um, I think a lot of uh, um, the church too, and I know I've spoken about this before, we, we put a lot of people between you and God. You know, you've got to go to a counsellor, you've got to go to a soul group leader, you've got to go to this, you've got to go to that, you've got to go. But I, I really believe if, if you want to ask me a question, who do I go to, you've got to go to the Holy Ghost. You've got to get a relationship with God. You, you've, got to, you've got to develop a personal, living, vital relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to know, you've got to know God in your own person. You've got to be able to go and sit in a room and quiet yourself and just allow the Lord to saturate your life and to allow him just to speak into who you are. He has the answer to everything. He is healing. He is deliverance. Um, you know, I sometimes think that, that um, you know, we want a deliverance minister to come in to set us free. When you've got the Holy Spirit, 
live in India, like sometimes I think what we do is we, we, we want to look to the natural. We need to lay hold of the spiritual. We need to, we need to lay hold of the Holy Spirit. We need to lay hold of God in our lives. And then you, and then you lay hold of God for other people's lives. That's how, that's how it works. Um, Salvation Army is an interesting story because, man, those guys were radical. And uh, you know what they do when they go into a town? They go into a town and they go after the worst sinners, the drunks, the alcoholics, the people living on the streets. They go for the worst of the worst. They led them to the Lord. It would create a wave of revival that would come. They were fervent. They were, you were to read those stories. They were, they were just uh, incredible. And... Um, Full of the Holy Ghost. Why did, why did they meet daily? You know, why is it on the prayer meeting on Friday morning when the girls get together here and pray that they come out full of the joy of the Lord and their faces are shining? Because, see, that's the key. You come and you saturate. You can do it at home, but you can come here together in the corporate. You saturate yourself in the presence of God. I love um, certain ministers in the nation that I really enjoy talking to because. We just talk about the Lord all the time. Um, uh, Don and I are always rattling on to each other, and you know we ring each other up and say, "Well, what, what's the Lord? You know, what scripture in this morning?" And like the week before last, he was he was in Galatians, you know, and he was he was hammering away in Galatians. I was somewhere I don't can't remember where I was, but that sort of fellowship around the things of the Lord, around the things of the Spirit. Spirit people want to want the fellowship about spirit things. It's the most important thing in your life. You want to talk about the things of the Spirit and um, build, build that up, build that up. So Heavenly Father, I just give you praise and glory and honour tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the challenge of the word. We thank you, Lord, that your word can bring change. We thank you, Lord, that your, the word can wash away doubts and fears and, and um, even false wrong doctrines, Lord, can be washed away by your word. Pray, Lord, that our hearts will be open. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you give us understanding and bear witness with our spirits, Lord, of what you're saying to the church in these days. And uh, Holy Spirit, I ask now that you would just minister to each one of us here uh, tonight. I ask, Holy Spirit, whatever the need is, you already know the needs. You know the number of hairs on our head. You know the needs before we ask. You know them. So, Father, by your Spirit, we just ask, come, Holy Spirit, and touch us. And minister to us at the point of our need. Come and, oh, just, I feel there's breakthrough for people in the realm of the Spirit. Just beautiful breakthrough in the Spirit. Some of you need to shake off the condemnation. You, you've, you've fallen, all right, you're a sinner. Who isn't? Get over it. Get up. Get, get back in place. Get, get repenting. Get, get Jesus back in the right place. Come on. Get up. Some of you, some of you are in bondage, and um, you know you I, you've got to push into the things of God. If you've got addiction and that in your life, you should be in the house every time the doors are open. You should be in that corporate anointing, believing that God is going to set you free. If you're not breaking through at home alone, get in the corporate anointing. Thank you, Lord.